Hello, listeners. This month, we will discuss the Benjamin Britten opera, The Rape of Lucretia. A mild warning, as you can tell from the title, this episode will deal with a mature subject matter. While, of course, we won't get explicit in our descriptions, we will be dealing with a sensitive topic that may trigger strong emotions. Thank you for joining us on Opera Avengers. I'm Alejandra Martinez, your guide to demystifying opera, an art form that was created by the people, for the people, and of the people. As always, this podcast will include spoilers. We believe that going into an opera already knowing the story can enhance your enjoyment. In opera, there are so many aspects and nuances to absorb that knowing the story beforehand allows you to sit back and enjoy the performance without having to worry about missing a subtitle or two. So think of our podcast as your Cliff's Notes, and be free to enjoy every minute of high-flying opera. The Rape of Lucretia was Benjamin Britten's first chamber opera, premiering in 1946. It was a rocky road to the premiere. Like its title, the opera's plot is very straightforward, dealing with difficult subject matter and commenting on gender and sexuality. This made censors very uncomfortable, and one official is quoted as condemning the opera's transparent efforts to wrap up an ugly fact in pretty language. Let's examine that further. Today we have a special treat. We will be joined by... That must be them now. Today we will be joined by one member from each of the choruses in the opera. Oh, two callers. Let's see what they have to say. Thank you. Sorry, Sorry for interrupting. interrupting. You're discussing the Benjamin Britten opera, yes? That's right. Well, well it, it turns out I'm an expert on the matter. As am I. We're the heads of the original choruses. Oh, well, we could certainly use your expertise. Absolutely. We'll be your link between the present day and ancient Rome. And so our story begins. The year is 510 B.C. Rome is ruled by the cruel Etruscan king Tarquinius Superbus, who wrested the throne from the true king of Rome through deception, duplicity, and murder. Now, Tarquinius Superbus has ordered Roman soldiers to fight a war against the Greeks. It's typical, really. Throughout history, kings have always created an enemy just to disguise how evil their own regime is. Well, our story truly begins at a biovac, an armed camp outside Rome. There, three soldiers sit around a fire, drunkenly discussing the virtues and uses of women. On the previous night, the soldiers made a bet. They would ride back to Rome and check on their wives to see who was faithful in their absence. Nearly every soldier was disappointed. The only two men spared embarrassment are members of the camp. Colatinus, whose wife, Lucretia, is arguably the most virtuous woman in Rome, the only one to refuse all suitors and remain true. On the other hand, Prince Tarquinius Sextus, son of the reviled Estruscan king, frequents brothels and therefore had no wife to betray him. That leaves Junius, the only one in the trio humiliated by his cheating wife. Colatinus and Tarquinius tease him about this, and Junius will have none of it. After Colatinus calls it a night, Junius pulls Tarquinius aside and proposes a new bet. He goads Tarquinius into testing the chastity of Lucretia, the only remaining faithful woman in Rome. Ever the womanizer, Tarquinius eagerly accepts, riding off to Rome. Meanwhile, Lucretia is at home, longing for her husband, passing the time by sewing with her mates, the like-minded Lucia and the maternal Bianca. The women are just about to go to bed when there is a knock on the door. The women freeze, apprehensive. Of course they're too afraid to answer it. At this hour, it's too late for a messenger. It's too loud to be a cordial visit. Through the locked door, Tarquinius boasts that he is the prince of Rome, and no one can refuse a prince. Despite the women's misgivings, they unbolt the door. 
Tarquinius looks Lucretia up and down with thinly veiled lust. He lies that his horse is lame and that he needs shelter for the night. Etiquette forces Lucretia to bid him enter and show him to a room. He kisses her hand and she bids him good night. Before we continue to Act Two, I think this is a good time to reiterate just what kind of world Lucretia is living in. The Etruscans have conquered Rome, killing many of the inhabitants, ordering the rest to build a lavish imperial city. Superbus ruled Rome with an iron fist, and so a population of masters became servants. The Etruscans recruit the men for war and seduce the women. The only people safe are the ones rubbing elbows with Etruscan officials. In, in this climate, how could Lucretia afford to refuse Tarquinius hospitality? Rome belongs to Romans. All tyrants fall. Even though tyranny is abstract, though crowds disperse, their beliefs remain. At the opening of Act Two, Lucretia sleeps fitfully, dreaming of Colatinus. Tarquinius silently slithers into her chamber. While she sleeps, he steals a kiss from her lips. Still dreaming, Lucretia mistakes Tarquinius for her husband, welcoming his presence. But when she awakes, she is horrified to discover Tarquinius. He offers himself to her, but she protests. But the overconfident Tarquinius, certain that truly she desires him, ignores her protests and continues to advance. He snuffs the candle with his sword, and in the darkness, he rapes her. Lucretia awakens the next morning, distraught and violated, but she carries herself with unnerving calm. She murmurs about waking from a nightmare. She is relieved to discover that Tarquinius has already gone. Lucretia demands to see Colatinus, and she dispatches a messenger to retrieve him. Her maid, Bianca, attempts to stop the messenger, but Colatinus arrives almost immediately, joined by Junius. Lucretia tells her husband of Tarquinius's horrific crime. Colatinus attempts to comfort her, seeming to genuinely understand her shame, 
but lucretia rejects his forgiveness believing that she can never be clean or pure again her answer is to drive a knife into her own heart all mourn lucretia's death Junius, inspired, seizes her bloody corpse as proof of Tarquinius's crime, and swears to use this tragedy to spark a rebellion against the Etruscan king, a revolution which Junius hopes will give him control of Rome. And so the story ends. That's all? Why should Lucretia so pure die? Why should the rest survive? All this suffering and pain? For nothing? Can we learn nothing from this? Perhaps. Since time began, love has always been destroyed by fate and design. Though human nature is frail and flawed, at the end of this tale, the Romans would eventually embrace Christianity, relying on one man to bear their sins and forgive them for their inevitable failings. I suppose this might be the redemption you seek. Our faithful listeners may have noticed a trend in a few of our showcased operas. Floria Tosca, desperate to escape prison, hurls herself from a balcony. Faced with betrayal and the shame of losing her dream, Madama Butterfly kills herself. In operas, especially the time when most stories took place, female characters were commonly violated or dishonored, believing that they could only redeem their purity through death not concerned with retribution against the offending party. Usually, if there was retribution, it was on a man's terms. Lucretia's defiled body is paraded not to condemn the suffering of a woman, but as proof of a man's infamy. In other words, it was not Lucretia's plan to spark a revolution. Rape is also present in the plot of operas including Floyd's Susanna and Mozart's Don Giovanni. Most recently, the Royal Opera House updated Rossini's Guillaume Tell to include an explicit rape scene. The performer's intention was to embellish a moment of backstory, but its inclusion stirred strong emotions, inciting outrage and walkouts. A Clockwork Orange, Straw Dogs, Last House on the Left, these are just a few films inciting controversy for the same reasons. I Spit on Your Grave is at once reviled by many for gratuitous violence, while embraced by few as an empowering revenge film. It's an artist's job to push boundaries and hold up a mirror to the horrors of real life, and few topics are spared their unflinching attention. I suppose The Rape of Lucretia attempts to apply a framework to the tragedy in an effort to understand it. I think that's an excellent way of putting it. Whatever you watch, read, or listen to, it's up to you, the audience, to interpret the material as you see fit, and discuss it with others to increase your own understanding. I would like to end this episode by saying that rape is a very serious issue, and silence is not always the answer. Help is available for those who need it, from RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. Their hotline is 800-656-HOPE. That's 800 800- 656-4673. Call them to be connected with a trained staff member from a sexual assault service provider in your area. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Opera Avengers. Until next month, I'm Alejandra Martinez. Thank you for listening. Opera Avengers is a production of the Great Lakes Light Opera, an organization based out of Cleveland, Ohio, dedicated to bringing opera and all local arts music to everyone. Want to learn more? Have a favorite opera you'd like us to showcase? Let us know. Visit us at greatlakeslightopera.com. Want to help out? Check our donation page or email us at greatlakeslightopera1 at gmail.com. The voice of the male chorus was Nick Farmer. Today's episode was scripted by Michael Sayeski. Additional research provided by Megan Thompson.